privileged to have Nathalie Desrosiers, Dean of Common Law, and today we are also very privileged to have my Dean, uh, the, the Dean of the Civil Law Section, um, Céline Lévesque. Oui. Alors, merci beaucoup, euh, Michel. Euh, D'abord, je dois dire que c'est un grand plaisir euh, d'être ici, d'avoir été invité à participer à cette conférence. Alors, je félicite euh, les organisateurs. Je pense que c'est déjà, euh, on peut constater là, que c'est déjà un grand succès. Uh, congrats also to all participants for tackling these uh, pres pressing issues of health law and policy. Uh, the focus of this panel is the future of global health, and we have two Uh, great speakers to uh, address these uh, this topic. Uh, so I will introduce them briefly because uh, I was told specifically not to read their bios, as you can all read and look in the program, uh, but I will say a word about uh, each of them. Uh, Stephen Hoffman is Associate uh, Professor at the University of Ottawa and Director of the Global Strategy Lab at the University. I have to tell you a little story about that. Last month we were in uh, China, Colleen, Stephen and I, to build collaboration with Chinese universities, including in health law and policy. And at some point, Stephen got introduced as the director of global strategy for the whole university. So he got quite a promotion. Hasn't been approved by Alan yet, but we're working on that. So it was great to, uh, to spend time with uh, Stephen and Colleen in China. Uh, so Stephen has done a lot, as you'll uh, see in his bio, he has uh, relationships with uh, McMaster, with Harvard, uh, and he specializes in global health law, global governance, and institutional uh, design. Today, he'll address international law and superbugs uh, after hearing uh, Ian Kerr, and now looking forward to Stephen uh, talk. I'm feeling really boring in my field of international investment law. Our presentations are not that, uh, that exciting. Uh, so our Our second speaker is Professor Chidi Oguamanam. Uh, he's a full professor also in the Faculty of Law. I'll say he's a bit of a Renaissance man, uh, if he allows me. He, uh, tries or succeeds in making links between law and policy around biodiversity conservation, uh, indigenous, indigenous knowledge and uh, IP. Uh, so his interests span uh, public health law policy, biomedical ethics, complementary and alternative medicine. So this uh, approach allows them to be part of three of our uh, research center, law, technology, and society, environmental law and global sustainability, and center for health, law, policy, and ethics, of course. So I'm very uh, pleased to be here uh, and to chair this panel. Both of them will speak about 15 minutes, uh, and then we'll have time for a discussion and uh, questions. So, Stephen? Uh, bonjour à tout le monde. Uh, merci beaucoup pour cette uh, opportunité. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. The key message uh, of my talk is going to be that the future of health law has to take account of the transnational health threats that we face in our world, both in terms of we need domestic health legislation that will protect us from threats coming from abroad, as well as we need better international laws that can help mitigate these challenges in the first place. And I say this, and I start off by showing this figure of the spread of the bubonic plague in Europe. Now, this started in 1347, and so what you see here is that each different color is showing a different year where the bubonic plague came to different parts of Europe. And so 700 years ago, this would be a map showing how disease spreads. But today, we live in a very different world where we're, we have uh, great interdependence and interconnectivity. Today, this is what our travel networks look like. Uh, we live in a world where we can travel literally everywhere within a certain number of hours. What this means is that someone, one could give a presentation at a public health conference in Rome, 
in the morning, later that day, teach their global health law class at the University of Ottawa in the afternoon, and then hop on a plane and meet Dean Levesque and Professor Colleen Fled in Shanghai, uh, as I did uh, last month, all in the one day. And so uh, academics like us, uh, who travel frequently, are uh, potential public health menaces when it comes to spreading infectious disease. But uh, don't worry, you don't have to stay away from me. I'm healthy right now. Ebola really brought this to the fore. So this was the story of last year and it continues to be a story. As of yesterday, there was a new case of Ebola in Liberia. Uh, Ebola brought this to the fore and it's because in, it used to be 40, over the past 40 years, we've seen that outbreaks like Ebola are often localized. So in this case, Ebola previously always happened in a particular area in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, each localized outbreak. But then this time around, the reason this was in the newspaper was because it went global. And so here's a map showing uh, different countries that were affected by it. So, so in Europe, the United States, uh, throughout West Africa. And people over here, well, the cartoon shows the United States, but people went crazy, uh, as we saw. And so today I'm not going to talk about pandemics. I'm going to, the, the kind that we hear a lot about in the news. Instead, I'm going to talk about a silent pandemic that's happening within our midst. Superbugs, uh, as the title of my uh, presentation uh, refers to. But unfortunately, uh, superbugs are not as cute as, uh, as the Bugs Bunny uh, here. Uh, they're actually quite terrifying. Uh, and they're terrifying because really what superbugs are, it's bacteria, it's viruses, it's fungus that are resistant to the drugs that we've developed that, oh, that, that, def that protect us for when we get sick with different infectious diseases. So what it means is antimicrobial resistance and superbugs is, is sort of the cute way of talking about it. What that means is that existing bacteria and viruses for which we do have drugs that, that used to work are slowly no longer working. And so that's uh, that it's a potentially an enormous threat to all of our health. And it conflicts with public expectations around what kind of medicines would work and what kind of diseases they don't necessarily have to worry about. And now we'll have to start worrying about. Just to show a brief uh, sort of science 101 about how antimicrobial resistance works. This, this phenomenon, it's a natural phenomenon in that it, when you have billions and billions of bacteria, for example, that are around the world, it just makes sense that by chance, by random chance, there's going to be some bacteria which are resistant to the drugs that we would want to use that would usually kill them. So for example, by random chance, you could have a bacteria that has a defect whereby a protein channel doesn't let something go in doesn't let a drug go in. Now usually, in most contexts, that's bad for the bacteria because it means that this protein channel, uh, it's, it's not working properly. But in the presence of antibiotics and antivirals, that defect is actually makes it a super bacteria because it means that when that bacteria is competing in a world of competition with other bacteria, it means they, have, they get to um, they get to proliferate and be prosperous. And so what you see here is a picture where in a world we have uh, one bacteria that's, that's not resistant, which, which we, can, we can kill with our, back, with our antibiotics. We have another bacteria that is resistant. And usually in the world, the ones that are not resistant do better because they're not, they don't have, for example, a defective protein channel. And so they, they spread quicker. But then in the third column, you see, we then, we use antibiotics to protect ourselves. And that's a good thing. But the problem is when we use them too much or when we use them inappropriately, we kill all of the non-resistant bacteria and then allow for the resistant ones to proliferate. And then when someone gets sick with that new bacteria at the end in the fourth column, suddenly the drugs that previously worked, they no longer work. Now this is a problem because we're not only using our antibiotics to promote human health, when, for example, when we get sick, we use them for various other purposes. So in the United States, 80% of all antibiotics are actually are not used in humans. They're used on farms to promote growth of animals because one of the byproducts, one of the side effects of antimicrobials is that it promotes uh, growth in animals. Globally, the figure is 75%, so not much better. We don't just use them, though, in animals and humans. We also use them in a product. So here's a material health and safety data sheet for a paint, specifically for the hull of a ship. The idea being that if it has an antibiotic formula, there'll be less mold on ships. 
Uh, now, that might be a very important use on ships, but uh, it means that we're using our limited effect, we're using our antibiotics, which are, have a limited effectiveness, we're using them to ensure that mold doesn't grow on ships. Maybe uh, more convincing is that we use our various antibiotics on different kinds of crops, so plants. Here's a list of antibiotics that are registered for use in the United States uh, for plant agriculture. So I flagged on the, on the right the streptomycin, which is a, a common antibiotic that probably many of us have taken at different times. And you'll see in the bottom of the list of plants that for which it's approved use is tobacco. What this means is that in parts of the world, we are literally spraying our tobacco plants with streptomycin so that we can make sure our tobacco is sufficiently vibrant that it can then be used and put in cigarettes and then kill people. This surely has to be a low value use of our antibiotics and is surely something that we don't want to see in the world. And the reason this matters is because there's a lot of lives at stake. So this diagram is showing, in blue you'll see the number of people who currently die from antimicrobial resistance in the world. It's now estimated at 700,000 people. But our modeling estimates going forward say that uh, by 2050, given the pace of resistance and how it's increasingly, our su superbugs are becoming ever more super and ever more resistant, we're expecting by 2050, 10 million people per year will die from this. And what that means is that it's 10 million people who are dying from diseases which currently we have drugs that kill those diseases, or that, that kill the bacteria and address the viruses. But by 2050, those drugs will no longer work. And so 10 million people are expected to die each year in 2050. And that will be more than cancer, which is expected to be 8.2 million people per year. And the reason uh, you might ask, why is an international lawyer like myself, why, do I, why am I delving into all this and sharing the science with you? It's because this is something that defies our national borders. Our viruses, our superbugs, they do not carry passports. They don't respect customs controls. It means when people travel across borders in planes from Europe to North America to Asia to Africa, they're carrying resistant bacteria and viruses with them. And so as a result, if we care about the health, if we care about our health within Canada, and we care about the health of people in other countries, we need to make sure that we're addressing this challenge uh, very much um, directly, and we can't wait until it comes to within our own borders. <laughs> Mapping that one example onto global patterns, what you see here is, these are, this is the travel, the, the, tra uh, the plane travel that I previously showed you. But now with the dots, you'll see those are outbreaks of resistant bacteria in different places from which they didn't start in those places. So the resistance came from a different uh, country. So for example, the red dots are all coming from India. And it's coming from India because of, uh, in, in India, there's a, a large use of carpapenems, which is a type of antibiotic, which probably in this room no one has ever used. Because here in Canada, and in many countries, it's a last resort antibiotic. And what that means is that our physicians will not prescribe it unless all the other types of antibiotics don't work and will only use it as a last resort. But in places where understandably, for example, in India, there's, there isn't the same kind of prescribing systems given there's a, lack of, there's a lack of doctors, a lack of health systems capacity. What that means is people can actually go to a, a store, a corner store, and buy the full range of antibiotics without a prescription from a doctor, without seeing a pharmacist. And I, I'm not blaming India. I'm blaming um, there's a, it's a global challenge. There's a lack of resources, but that we, we, we are affected by this as well. We're all in it together. And so my research is really, a lot of it's about, and what I, for the rest of the presentation what I'll talk about is that it's a no-brainer that we do something about these superbugs. Antimicrobial resistance, it's real, it's a problem. We can all see that when we look at the data. But then why aren't we then seeing the necessary level of action to do something about this problem? And from our perspective, we're the lawyers and social scientists. In some respects, it's actually, it's, we shouldn't be that surprised. When I talk to uh, my medical and public health colleagues, they often sort of say, oh, well, this is a problem, so we have to do something about it. And why is it that we're just not doing something about it? Here, it's, uh, it's kind of clear that when the case of antibiotic resistance, there's several game theoretic problems that we face. It's really a classic collective action problem, whereby there's 
we have various goals, so we can maybe we can break this up, this problem into three different goals or three different challenges we face. One is innovation, in that historically over the last 60 years, whenever we've faced resistance, we've just developed a new antibiotic, and that new one that bacteria had never seen before. The last 20 years, we haven't seen that kind of innovation. So one challenge and one goal is to create new antibiotics to make sure that we have a new, we have more pipeline of, of what can work against bacteria and viruses and fungi. The second is we have to conserve ones that exist. But that's really hard because when we have, essentially you can view antimicrobials as if it's a common pool resource. There's a limited effectiveness of them and each person who uses an antimicrobial draws on that limited pool of effectiveness. It's kind of like climate change. We have one world, we have one, we have one ecosystem. We also have one common pool of antimicrobial effectiveness. And so it's a, it's a classic global commons dilemma that we face, whereby each person, because they know that they, they can draw on the resource, they can draw on this common pool of antimicrobial effectiveness, and it's other people that, uh, that will bear the, most of the cost, uh, because they'll be cured and others, the drugs won't work for them, other people. And the third is access. The challenge with access is that every time we use it, there is a negative externality. There's a cost to other people that we don't bear. There's free rider problems and that others, uh, people will often say, well, we need new drugs, but maybe we don't have to pay for it. Maybe the United States, they're a much larger economy, they'll fund the research and then us in Canada, we can benefit or different, similar um, arrangements like that. And even when we do agree and we all take action, in the case of surveillance, for example, many countries in the world are tracking antimicrobial resistance as it's developing, but they track it in different ways and they, have it, they don't have standards on how to actually, how they define this issue, nor ways of um, actually measuring it over time. And so the first problem, as I mentioned, was that there's all these game theoretic challenges. It's a classic collective action problem. But the other problem is that this is a complex policy area where we need interdependent action. And because the, the reason for that is that if we only promote innovation, if we only have innovation without access, it's just unjust, right? So we have innovation only for some people in the world. That's not fair. But the same point, if we have innovation without conservation, it's wasteful because we'll develop a new antibiotic and then a couple years later it won't work anymore. So that's just a waste of money. The other reason is that in term, in the other goal in terms of conservation, conservation by itself actually undermines access. Of course, a lot of conservation is about limiting use, restricting access, but it also undermines innovation in that if we constrict access, we have a smaller market, a smaller number of people who would pay for the innovation. And third, we can't, we can't just address access by itself because access without conservation and innovation actually speed resistance. So there's millions of the people in the world who don't currently have access to antimicrobials, but simply giving access without giving appropriate access means that we'll actually speed up this problem. So it means it's, it's, it, there's no silver bullet. There's no, there's no single solution. It's interdependent action that's needed. And we can see the results of these game theoretic problems uh, and the interdependent action that's needed here in our home in Canada. So this was um, the first um, Auditor General report of 2015. Report number one was focused on antimicrobial resistance. And so the Auditor General of Canada, in looking at the action that the Canadian government has been taking over the last five years, or rather inaction of the Canadian government in the last five years, have found that the government has not fulfilled its key responsibilities to mitigate this problem. And again, that when you look at it just from one country, that kind of makes sense because of the game theoretic problems I talked about. How we, it's a global commons dilemma, free rider issues, and even if Canada did take action as it needs to take, but even if it did take robust action, there was infection control, great surveillance, lots of money, the reality is that Canada can't solve this problem on its own. All it takes is one person flying from Rome and then Shanghai and coming back to Toronto, uh, coming back to Toronto or Ottawa or Vancouver uh, and carrying resistant bacteria or viruses with them. And so we're in this epic fight between microbes and antibiotics, or as the figure shows, bacteria versus antibiotics. We're in this epic fight and 
myself and others working in this space are recognizing we need new tools. We need better tools in order to address this issue. And we need tools that go beyond one country, given that one country alone can't solve everything. And so several of us have been calling for an international legal framework to address antimicrobial resistance. We're calling for, essentially, um, a global health law in order to address this issue, recognizing that we can't do it within individual countries alone. And so why international law? So I'm, I'm someone who's written actually quite, quite a bit about maybe we shouldn't use international law to address every challenge, thinking that we, in, in this room, we know that law is expensive, it creates all sort of processes, and it also doesn't always achieve the exact outcome that we want it to achieve. But in this case, I think there's some clear, compelling reasons why an international law would be quite helpful. The first is, as I said, the interdependence among countries, which means we need everybody to act. It's not just enough if we act ourselves. Second is the interlocking actions, meaning that we can't actually do this unless we do it as one larger, comprehensive package. Third is that actions are costly, and they're needed now, whereas the benefits are long-term and far off. They're, lot, they're, they're, they're not directly um, linked to our action now. These are long-term things. And so yet, we live in a political environments, in democracies especially, especially, whereby when short-term interests differ from long-term interests, it's often difficult to get action completed. When politicians know that the benefits of their costly actions now won't be accrued until the next guy's in office. So that's a problem. And so when we look at this, though, what it means is that in order to solve this, it's clear that we need some sort of institutionalized grand bargain. And so just to conclude, it's clear that when we're looking towards a grand bargain, we need to both figure out what do we want countries and all actors to do in terms of providing access, conservation, innovation. But we also have to think of the implementation mechanism. So what would an international law look like? What would international institutions and interest mobilizers, how can we, how can we really solve this problem? And so on the first, we have lots of, lots of science that's coming out. Uh, yesterday, I was in London uh, for the launch of uh, the Lancet as a medical journal. They've launched a new series on antimicrobial resistance, which is really focused on providing a roadmap for the future. That follows work by the World Health Organization and other governments to really highlight what kind of national policies do we need. So the content, we have a lot happening. What we have less of is on the implementation mechanisms. So yesterday, coinciding with the release of the Lancet, set series. Um, a paper of mine was released in the bulletin of the World Health Organization, which is really trying to map out what are these different strategies, these global strategies we can pursue to achieve collective action on an issue where there's a classic collective action problem. And there's additional work that many, that several people um, have been trying to do, thinking through, okay, what would be the right forum? What would be the right kind of mechanisms? Are there, should there be enforcement uh, protocols in place? And so just to conclude, it's, in my mind, we're talking about the future of health law here. It's clear then that the future of health law has to include legal protections against these transnational health threats uh, that, rests, that risk the well-being of all of us. Uh, because if not, I think we'll all end up being sorry. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to join everybody to thank um, Colin and the team for inviting me. Uh, for me, it's actually a personal um, joy to be one of the uh, alumni of this uh, uh, program, and also the opportunity to be reconnected with um, my colleagues from the Dalhousie University, from where I escaped to U Ottawa some five years ago. So what I want to bring to the conversation is essentially a global dimension to what you could think about was the panel, the first panel yesterday. 
And I wanted to thank uh, Sherry. If she's not here, I'm posting thanks to her for doing a pro bono research assistance to, to me for this project. So the objective of this uh, conversation is essentially to identify and examine gaps in regulatory and legal interventions and gaps and opportunities to negotiate transition in end of life care from medical fertility to palliative care. And we do this essentially looking at Canada as a framework to look at the global space where this is happening. So we locate this conversation from two major decisions that appear to have, um, that have certainly got some attention recently from Canada. And uh, even though these two decisions don't seem to have identical facts, they are actually opposite sides of the same debate in, in one way or the other. And so we're looking at the idea of right to life, whether there is a duty to live or right to reject treatment, whether there is a duty to demand it. So these two cases appear to have mapped out uh, future conversations in end of life care in Canada. And what are the drivers? In addition to these two cases, a lot of uh, developments are happening in this country that will really continue to pour fuel um, onto the fire of the tensions around end of life care. Some of those we're so familiar with, but I would pay attention to the very last one. Um, the healthcare provider diversity in this country is no longer what it used to be several years ago because most medical practitioners and nurses are coming not from Ireland or England or elsewhere in Europe. They are coming essentially from Africa and Asia. And therefore, because ethics is also a matter of culture and personal experience, those are going to really constitute some degree of tension in emergency rooms as to how these decisions are being made. And so end-of-life care as a concept, I, I would not bore this very influential audience on, on what end-of-life care, other than to really highlight the fact that it is not limited to the elderly. And this is a fact that one would have thought is so obvious, but when you look at the text of uh, the relevant legal instruments, particularly at a global level, that doesn't seem to be the case. And how about medical fertility? Well, is a concept that is self-evident in terms of the two worlds we have joined together. But what I have found is that where the naked reality of harm is the virtual result of continuing treatment, then we have a case of medical futility. And, and it's because of this situation that transition to palliative care becomes very compelling. But here in Canada, we have two different regimes as to how that is negotiated and how that transition is made. And we have a statute-backed framework in Ontario and Yukon. And uh, elsewhere in Canada, we have resort to common law and, of course, uh, ethical regimes in, in cases of institutions. And this case, particularly the Rosuli case, appears to have actually brought a lot of attention, particularly in regard to Ontario. Um, the Supreme Court has said that um, the Health Care and Consent Act in Ontario applies to giving and, and, and refusing <coughs> consent incidental to treatment. And of course, under that statute, treatment goes beyond clinical opinion of what constitutes patients' best interest. And, and the statute goes ahead and the court affirms that to, 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 to to declare that treatment includes legally uh, actions legally recognized as having health-related purpose. And the problem with this, and the, major, the minority in that case highlighted this, is that uh, for a care provider, an action may have health-related purpose, but it's not in the best interest of the patient. And so we have a situation where there is almost like an inclination to really empower surrogate decision makers and probably create some degree of tension between them and the professional and ethical opinion of healthcare providers.
And so we begin to see two regimes emerging, while the rest of the Canada will fall back to the common law, and whereof you could see that there is a degree of weight and significant one given to the opinion of clinicians. And in the other one, not necessarily so, but yet you could see that that decision has created some degree of, uh, of, of food for thought going forward. So there are two, there are one major study I wanted to look at in relation to the future of end-of-life care. And it's suggesting that the patronage of CCB is increasing. Um, between 2009 and 2013, it has risen to 235%. And this very study came to some conclusions. I was discussing with Professor Downey this morning about this, and she advised me to, to be a little more critical about what to make of this, this, uh, these conclusions. But the point here is that surrogate decision makers, uh, according to the finding of this study, tend to focus on their own values, or in fact to conflate their own values with the values of the patient. And physicians in the CCB approach tend to look at the clinical conditions of the patient, and the CCB itself would all naturally uh, emphasize the statutory requirements. So what you find here is that in this model, which appears to have some degree of respect and popularity uh, accorded to it across the country, uh, the value sets that you use to determine the best interest of the patient appear to be hushed and foggy. And they are co-opted in a bridge and what I call shallow interpretative outlook, always focusing from the linear prism of surrogate decision makers, the care team, and the CCB. But end of life is really a very complicated process as we make the negotiation to transition to palliative care. It goes beyond those entities I mentioned in the last uh, uh, slide and, and involves the community of faith, the community of culture, the family, the care provider team, and the substitute decision maker in that case. So when palliative care is the care, the consequence is that we will eventually have to deal with what it entails. It's not really a narrow framework for understanding uh, all the stakeholders involved in this transition. Unfortunately, um, palliative care has been if you like, um, a victim of bad press in terms of how people receive it. But she speaks about collectivity in the way we, we make the transition. But how about the global profile of palliative care? Um, Canada is one of the countries out of 20 that are said to have integrated palliative care into our system. But the question we have not asked is, how robust is that, given the tensions that we have in negotiating that transition? It's always really a big tension. And palliative care also is one of the major issues of global health inequity divide. And the World Palliative Care Alliance has released the first ever global atlas of palliative care, looking at it from the point of view of access to pain uh, medications across the globe. And if you map out, as they have done, what happens? It is very, very challenging in terms of you to see there are parts of the world where people who are destined to die, die in serious pain without access to any palliative care. Some other people that have studied this have described uh, the lack of palliative care globally as a matter of global health injustice, and one of them calls it the most insidious injustice. So you can see at that, look at that slide and see how much palliative care drugs are consumed between United States and Canada in relation to the rest of the world. That raises a major global health uh, inequity a case or crisis on its own. But how does the law support this? The law, in fact, if you look at the critical sections of the human rights law and even the WHO framework, palliative care is mentioned marginally. Um, if you look at uh, the first elaboration of um, of the right to health by the, uh, by, by, by the general, uh, under the general comment number 14, they took the concept of palliative care and filed it under care for the elderly. 
And within that document, there is only one mention of palliative care. All you need to do is to have a biased reading of it and begin to see places they mentioned vulnerable people where they made references to discrimination and then you begin to get the picture. But the truth of the matter is that palliative care is highly marginalized from the global health in, uh, uh, context. But then there has been some significant uh, uh, movements lately and I emphasize lately um, in relation to getting palliative care the right place. It, supposed to occupy in global health policy. The WHO has actually included medicines for palliative care in essential medicines least only recently. And there's been a lot of move to really put palliative care into the sustainable development goals that we had in 2015 September. But that could not happen. If you look at the global sustainable development goals, I think health is uh, uh, number three. And you look at all the goals articulated, all the targets articulated under it, there was no mention of palliative care. Despite what the Harvard Global Equity Initiative has done, and all other initiatives, including those of the International Congress on Palliative Care, which in last year had what they call the Montreal Declaration, designed to push palliative care into the sustainable development goals. That did not work. And then widening down, I wanted to highlight this, because in terms of talking talking about the future of, of, of healthcare from the global perspective. Given the statistics I gave you, the baby boomer generation, we no longer want to die. We live long, and I like that. No objections to that. But the truth of the matter is essentially to suggest to us that we have to really begin to engage the big elephant in the room. For as long as we're going to have people in their 80s, 90s, 100s as a significant percentage of our population, we have to begin to understand that negotiating medical fertility and palliative care requires that we begin to really take significant steps to leverage upon the promises of palliative care. So emerging dynamic in Canada, the very dynamic in Canada, because I, I talked about the multicultural nature of our healthcare providers, and the very tension, almost the two-way approach of negotiating that transition across jurisdictions in Canada, require that even though we enjoy a respectable profile globally as one of the countries out of 20 representing 8.5% of global population that appear to have integrated palliative care into our system. We need to recognize that it is not yet Uhuru, as we say in Africa. But the truth of the matter is this. I do not have any fixated position. I was at a conference not too long ago where this issue of palliative care came into discussion and everybody was talking about advanced care directive and all that stuff. But when the rubber hits the road, uh, it is a personal matter. So, and, and what is more important is really the phrase I got from Justin Downey's work, which was really one of the foremost works that actually preempted the outcome of Carter. And whether you let go of life or life lets go of you, in whatever circumstance, it's always a universally sober moment. But it's yet deeply personal experience for all stakeholders in end of life care. And so it is actually a work in progress and the future of global health care has to confront the inequity in relation to palliative care access for the rest of the globe and even within Canada as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have about 15 minutes for questions and discussion. So if I could ask you to introduce yourself and ask, if possible, brief questions. My name is uh, Emilia Ordolis from the Department of Justice. My question is for Stephen Hoffman. Uh, you spoke about uh, the grand bargain and your work on the international legal framework to address AMR, which I think is wonderful. Um, have you had any success or at what level have other disciplines beyond health been engaged? I think you showed how it involves agriculture and water, human animal health. Um, 
ecosystem health trade even if we're really going to change our how our food supply is structured um, what success do you see in engaging all these other areas for real change great should I answer it mm -hmm. great so yeah so thanks Emily for the um, the question um, so uh, sh first I should say that um, we there is some there is quite a bit of progress in recognizing this as a challenge and uh, the kind of action that's needed um, being a lot of action uh, actually I, sh I should have mentioned my talk that this week is uh, the world it's the first world antibiotic awareness week uh, so uh, that's why um, I was in London yesterday for that that's why the Lancet launched that new series there's been um, there's uh, pins that uh, they, the World Health Organization made, and uh, there's been several, you might have seen in the news, uh, superbugs, because this, the UN did declare this week and every future week of, of this, um, sorry, this week and every future year to be World Antibiotic Awareness Week. But uh, as of right now, there's uh, representatives for the World Health Organization today speaking in New York to try to arrange next year to get this on the UN General Assembly's agenda. Um, there's been lots of talk. Uh, I mean, Prime Minister Cameron in the UK, he's commissioned an independent review from Jim O'Neill to look at uh, what are the global action that's needed. Uh, at least um, before the uh, Paris uh, attacks um, of last week, uh, the next G7 summit was, there was supposed to be a big focus on antimicrobial resistance, although I've been hearing um, that may uh, change in light of last week. But uh, so uh, the, the political priority uh, being achieved is, is it's growing, which is fantastic. In terms of other sectors, which you asked about, um, it's going to be hard, uh, but that being said, the stakes are so high, the number of lives at risk are so great that uh, people are starting to say we need, we need to do something. And when, if you ask people like in the livestock industry, so livestock is responsible for 80% of antibiotic use at the moment. When you ask them, they say, well, um, of course they don't want regulations that would prevent the use of antibiotics in livestock, uh, which right now is what's facilitating sort of factory farm conditions. But they say what would be, what wouldn't be as bad is if it was global regulation. Because what they care, for example, in the United States, where this is, there's the most usage of antibiotics, what they care most about is market competitive dynamics. They don't want to be at a, dis, a disadvantage when competing against Canadian farmers, European farmers, African farmers. So a, they actually aren't so upset about the idea of a global approach. Uh, so when you hear that, maybe the, the, inter, the lobbies that might be against these kind of regulations at a national level, it, it, when you look globally, Globally, actually, they're not so against the idea. So that's why I'm a bit hopeful. Yeah. Other questions? I'm just going to yell over here. Everybody can hear me. Um, you just mentioned about the G7 possibly being kind of rescheduled to talk about the MR and other <coughs> I think that's happened with AMR before, where mm -hmm. other pandemics and emergency sorts of situations have gotten in the way of that conversation. Are there mechanisms or ways forward to keep that kind of on the table in light of everything else that is also an emergency? Yeah, so uh, another good question. So, uh, but I, so I think that the data is going to keep it high on the agenda. This problem is something we've been trying to address for 60 years. It's something we have not been able to address. Um, as a, well, actually, I guess the last 60 years, our solution has always been just to invent a new antibiotic, which bacteria had never seen before. And therefore, uh, it would work, at least for a few years. Uh, but now, 50% uh, of, for example, gonorrhea cases are resistant. And there's all sorts of diseases where um, we, uh, people used to assume that you could just take a shot of antibiotics or a few, pop a few pills, and it would be bye-bye. And uh, But no longer that's the case. So uh, where, as, this, as the situation gets worse and worse, and we keep on getting new indicators uh, showing how bad the situation is, it'll, um, hopefully, it'll stay on the political agenda. Uh, but I am, I am, I'm, I am hopeful. We're starting to see, uh, we're starting to see some of the big actors decide that we need to finally do something about this. Yeah. Chidi, I, I wasn't, I'm not 100 percent sure where you're going with, with, uh, <laughs> with uh, your uh, talk and paper there, and it is, is the. Is there is the main issue where you came out at the end uh, around 
the a worry around um, assisted death and the movement towards assisted death, coupled with in many jurisdictions in the world, um, inability to access quality quality palliative care. Is that is that the concern? Is that is that individuals uh, in jurisdictions um, they don't have access to those um, kinds of drugs? Assisted death may be a cheaper alternative, um, or the only alternative, really, um, in the face of suffering. Is that is that where you're? Um, it's more of um, access to the kind of medicines that are necessary to have a robust palliative care experience. I am not probably in a position, perhaps never thought about this significantly or uh, seriously, um, whether the move toward assisted debt will find traction in many developing countries. I can speak particularly for Africa, but I would be inclined to think that access to palliative care would require access to pain-reducing drugs, and the whole protocol around transitioning from medical fertility to palliative care, which is really a big deal here, as in most other developed countries. We already checked the list that Canada is one of those countries that have integrated palliative care into their system. We tend not to understand the, the very challenge of negotiating that transition. And that is really what is the major issue right now and here. But to the rest of the world, particularly Africa, I think that the global health inequity as evident from access to palliative care and pain relieving medicines towards the end of life is one of the major issues. So what I'm trying to say in one breath is to say, as much as we have it checked that Canada is one out of 20 countries that have integrated palliative care, it is still a work in progress. And before we could even think about that, we should make it the whole experience of dying and having some degree of relief before one breathes one's last breath has to be something of global health inequity and justice. The, you know, there has to be some degree of justice about access to palliative care medicines. Mm -hmm. So in um, developing countries, and middle income countries, with uh, limited um, you know, economies, limited resources, uh, can you tell us anything about how they prioritize palliative care rather relative to other things that they feel they that need that need their resources? Um, it's, it's not for the country the few of the countries I know and exposed to it, there is no public pub, publicly funded health. So whether you have access to palliative care would be a factor of your standing in the society and your ability to get the best possible medical care in the environment. And so what you see again is um, the quality of health care in a given economy or country or society um, would definitely uh, reflect the quality of uh, palliative health care, wherever, wherever if, if ever is available. The same thing happens in um, um, in childbirth. All of this, they all play a role, like uh, maternal mortality and all that kinds of stuff. So, um, the ability to have um, to have um, access to the right medicines, particularly when it comes to end of life care, is something. I personally believe would require a, a non-market intervention uh, because end-of-life care is, is really um, where everything comes together, whether for the individual, the community, or the healthcare system. If we have time, maybe I yeah. can. Um, so, if we have, if we have time, um, should I ask you a question? What role do you think? Um, 
international law will play in addressing this challenge. I ask that because, um, of course, international law right now already put there's some internationals are facilitative in promoting access to medicines, but more so we talk about international law actually putting up barriers to access to medicines. And then plus, in terms of pain medication, many pain medications are actually listed as narcotics. That's right. And so they fall under the whole war on drugs uh, regime, meaning um, access to those medicines is particularly challenging and international law is putting up lots of barriers to that. So what, what sort of reforms do you think might be needed at the international level in order to ensure that even if countries were to decide to prioritize uh, palliative care, that they wouldn't run up against the international legal barriers to doing so? Yeah, that's a very good question, uh, Steve. Um, the WHO and the essential medicines lists, as, as you know, has lift, uh, listed palliative care medicines. And that, for me, represents an opportunity to now begin to talk about access. Who gets it? In what context? And there's always this concern that, okay, if you made it available, it is going to be abused or going to wrong hands in, in all of these situations. And, and so, fundamentally, the, 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 the structure for health care governance in, in all of these countries is a major issue. Let me give you an example, because international law has not in my view and from my research paid attention to the idea of palliative care. If you look at those 20 countries I put out there uh, where we say they have integrated palliative care, only one African country is in that least, and it's not even South Africa as some of you would suspect, it is Uganda. And it's because the, the Harvard Global Health Equity Initiative has decided to go on ground and begin to build capacity and, and eventually was able to work hard enough whereby Uganda is able to make that list. So the position here is that uh, it goes back to the normal approach to handling inequity in global healthcare. Whether you call it um, a health governance by foundation or not, I'm only interested in the critical reality that how it translates into making changes on ground. We've reached our time, so thank you very much. Merci à tout le monde. Merci à nos conférenciers. All right, to keep this tradition going, um, uh, my name is Catherine Marie Blay. I'm a CHR student. I'm currently doing my master thesis on orphan drug and normative framework in Canada. Uh, il me fait très grand plaisir de remercier et uh, féliciter les présentateurs pour votre très intéressante conférence. Alors, merci beaucoup. So.